It's my pleasure to invite our next presenter. <laughs> Dear Tiedke, Adolf Stiak, Povitek, Germany. He has more than 15 years of experience in design, implementation, and commissioning of optimization and monitoring solutions for cement works, waste to energy, and coal fired power plants. He has added Stiak since 2001. His work takes him across Europe, South America, as well as Southeast Asia and Middle East. Since 2016, he has been responsible for sales in India, China, and Turkey. Mr. Dirk, we welcome you on the stage. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today because it increased my mood a little bit because Germany lost the semi-final 2-0 against France last night. So I hope that is not a bad sign for us. <laughs> okay, today we want to talk a little bit about the cement industry. I think cement industry is a very important industry for every nation, especially growing nations like India. Because urbanization, new infrastructural projects, uh, have a big demand or uh, build a big demand for cement or concrete. Uh, you have to build roads, houses, airports, whatever. Everywhere you use cement. First two short slides about Steag. If you don't know Steag, uh, we are uh, a German company, Steag, um, located in Essen, that is in West Germany. Uh, we are operating coal-fired power plants mainly, but are striving more for the renewable energies in Germany and one we are one of the biggest energy producers in uh, Germany. But we have also other power plants around the world. And of course, here, especially in India, we are making uh, uh, operation and maintenance for a lot of uh, power plants. The Stierk GmbH is a mother company with the power plants, uh, but it has a subsidiary, the Stierk Energy Services. And this uh, subsidiary is taking care about the engineering, about plant services, uh, operation, maintenance, and so on. Another subsidiary of it is the Stierk Powitek GmbH. That is where I'm located. And uh, the Stierk acquired this smaller company roughly uh, three years ago. So we were already active since 2001 in the fields of optimization of power plants, cement plants, waste to energy, and so on. Another subsidiary is the Stierk Energy Services India. It's located in Noida. Uh, we are employing roughly 2,500 people there, making O&M engineering services and so on. So, and now we are striving for the cement industry here in India and trying to bring our solutions to this industry. So, if we talk about these buzzwords, IoT, cloud, big data, APC, and so on, what, what are we thinking in the first place? Someone of us is maybe thinking of uh, full automated production with a full automated and integrated workflow in food, medicine, pharmacy, cars, whatever. And I think from an automation perspective, it is possible to make it more or less 100% automated. We heard it from Siemens, there are solutions available to do it. Okay, that is an automation. Others are thinking maybe of these big internet companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so on. So they invented a lot of these buzzwords. Others are thinking maybe of house automation, an automated fridge, which is maybe um, buying automatically new products from a, from a shop uh, if a certain amount of, of milk is missing in the fridge, or something like this or security applications, automatic handling of lighting scenarios, and so on in housing. One other big point is maybe automated driving. So my, my daughter, for example, she always wonders, oh, how is this working? Because I'm driving a car actually in Germany, which for example, keeps a certain distance to the next car in front of me or which parks automatically uh, in, the, in the next parking lot or something like this. So there's a lot available already. So there is a high degree of automation already installed. Or we can think about interconnected cars, for example. Yeah, so not only automation of a single car, but maybe some guidance system on top of it to make 
um, the load on our streets of cars more efficient so that we can drive faster and come better from one point to the next uh, if, we, if we control all the cars together. So there are a lot of possibilities how you can think about these buzzwords. But most of you don't think about this. That is, I call it dinosaur technology. Yeah, here we are producing bulk material. That is an example of a rotary kiln of a cement plant. Here, uh, one of the main intermediate products, the clinker, is produced. So what is the status in this type of uh, uh, industry? I want to give a little bit overview of this. Because not all of you are maybe familiar with uh, cement or clinker production, I want to give just a rough overview of what, what is happening there. So cement uh, is a natural product. That means it all starts by a quarry, a limestone quarry. There, limestone is excavated, and these big limestone rocks are then crushed to smaller sizes. Then there is an addition of typically sand and clay, maybe iron ore, but just to a few percentage. And then it is ground again in a grinding mill to a very or finer powder, finer particle size, before it enters the so-called clinker production. That is the heart of the cement production. And that is covered here in the preheater tower, in the rotary kiln, which we saw on the picture, and of course then later also in this so-called clinker cooler. So this material enters the preheater tower, is uh, preheated to, uh, let's say, temperature of roughly 950,000 degrees, something like this, enters this long rotary kiln. The size of it is maybe a diameter of between, let's say, three and six meters, and the length is typically let's say 40 to 70 meter, it depends a little bit on the, on the technology. Uh, here is a, a, a big burner at the, at the end of this rotary kiln, which uh, gives the energy to heat the material up. And then it comes out of this process and is cooled down in a very fast way to below 850 degree. And then it comes out of the cooler with a temperature of, let's say, 100, 120 degree. So and during this time, this material makes a lot of changes um, in a mineralogical way, so that at the end of the day, you have this so-called clinker. And that is a base product which, combined with some gypsum, for example, you can grind in a, in a mill, in a cement mill, to the final cement, which is then uh, given by trucks or, or railroad or whatever to the end client. So that is, um, that is a, um, a, the process. Itself. So it's a very energy intensive process and here I have a, a rough overview what is the demand of thermal energy for this clinker production. And let's say we don't want to go into the last uh, digit here but let's say on the, on this, this, uh, this laser is not working anymore. Okay, so if you have a, a look at the uh, second row the theoretical requirement to make cement is roughly, let's say, 1.7 1 uh, uh, million joule per ton of clinker. If you have a look at the last row, the total which is really used, let's say, in modern kilns is in the range of double of it, in the range. There are differences, but three and a half million joule. So there is a lot of loss of energy. Um, most of them you cannot really influence or not easily influence. But there are others which can be optimized. For example, uh, exit gas losses. If you reduce, for example, the temperature of the exit gas, of course, you lose less energy. And there are other examples for it. So that could be something to optimize. Now let's have a look at what is the actual status in a typical cement plant, not only here in India, worldwide. There is not so big difference. If we have a look at software and hardware, there are DCS or PLCs most often installed. Um, we have, of course, typically a SCADA system for the operators of these plants, so they can look at the, at the readings, at the temperatures, mass flows, and all these kind of things. Sometimes, not always, there is a data historian to have a look at maybe data from half a year or a year ago. Often they are very limited, so again, it depends a little bit uh, uh, how good the system is. 
So that is, um, let's say, so-so situation. If we have a look at the control loops, and that is true worldwide, we see that there is basically only one control loop which is always there for the production of clinker. And that is the under pressure in the kiln. Because if there would be overpressure, all this dusty material would come out, out of every hole, uh, and that would mean a big danger for the people working at the kiln site. So that is a must have, that's clear, and that is also controlled. But then there's maybe small control on the cooler side, yeah? maybe some uh, differential pressure is, is, is estimated and then uh, more or less air goes through the cooler, that's all. Sometimes you have the kiln RPM, how fast is this kiln rotating connected to the complete load of material coming into the kiln, but it's also very simple, it's just a characteristic curve. Of course, you have these controls of making some pressure here or some pressure there quite constant. But for the production, for the energy efficiency of a kiln system, there's no control available, nothing, nowhere. So that means the situation is, in average, that there is only manual control of these dinosaurs. It is a reactive manual control, that means only you observe the process, and if something goes wrong, there is an action taking place. And there is definitely no control which follows the company targets. What, is, what does it mean, or the enterprise targets, or however you want to call it? That is, for example, a certain production level, or it is a demand for a certain energy efficiency in production. So there is no control available which directly goes for these uh, measures. How is the operation typically organized? That is the same as maybe in all uh, production environments, but I just want to mention it here. Um, of course, you have some upper management, and they give some targets. We want to produce this and that amount. Uh, we have, want to have an energy efficiency like this. Maybe if you do not only use coal to fire, maybe alternative fuel mixture is an, is an interesting point. Then these targets go to the production management. And this production management is basically um, <coughs> organizing the other groups of maintenance, quality management, and the operations itself. So the maintenance guys, mechanical, electrical engineers, are sitting together every morning, analyzing what went wrong, what was good, and where were problems. And then they try to solve these problems. They go to the site, maybe they find something, or they have a look at data, or whatever. And then they do actions. The quality management is also very important in this product, because if the quality is very bad, the strength of the cement, or later concrete, is bad. And that leads to the problem of houses falling uh, or uh, uh, are not stable enough for a lot of people. So that is a very important point. And then, of course, the operations. That means all the operators sitting in front of the SCADA systems, maybe the process engineers, all they come together and talk about all the problems and so on. So and the question is, in my opinion, if we talk about advanced process control or advanced technologies, it doesn't matter what it is, we have to go exactly for these peoples which are really running the business. So our our main target is to focus on the operations of these kind of applications, cement plants or uh, power plants. I think for a company it is important to have an idea what is their general approach to solving problems or to give solutions to customers. Um, in our case, we say we have this so-called SAPC strategy or philosophy. If we want to do control in a better way, to go for the really important targets, then it is necessary to use analyzation of data. That is on the top. Data mining process intelligence. What does it mean? We all know in a cement plant, in a power plant, wherever, you have thousands of measurements. But who is using this information? No one. Maybe in some special cases, investigation in some, in some signals is there. But typically, you have a look at these typical 30 signals which are important for the production in general. No one looks at 1,000. So 
That is something which can be optimized because there is sometimes information already available in other signals which show there will be a problem with these big signals which you have a look at every day. Okay, so that is one important point. Another one is the prediction. Because if we talk about um, quality, for example, quality of the clinker, of the production, then what is a typical pr procedure? Some guy is going to the production, taking some sample from this material, bringing it to the laboratory, there it is analyzed, maybe automatically, and then this information, the result, is transferred back to the operations. But he stands not all day long there and every minute he takes a sample. No, he takes it, let's say, between two and four hourly. So that means during the other time, you really don't know what your quality is. You estimate, you have an idea what your quality is, but not more. So that means this prediction, if it can help to give a signal for this discontinuous quality uh, value, would be very interesting. And it is needed to make good control, which takes quality into consideration. Another one might be sensing. We all know the typical sensors, pressure, temperature, mass flows, volume flows, that are everywhere in plants. But they only are punctual, just measurements at this or that point. Now you have a production environment which is 100 meter long in a, in a cement plant. And you have maybe, on this whole way, you have maybe 30, 30 signals. But you have a big production environment. You have the flame, for example, which is very important for the production of the clinker, but you only have maybe a punctual temperature of it. That's all. So to go for other sensors, smart sensors, which give you more valuable information of what is really going on inside, might be of help. And fourth, then, the control. It must incorporate all of these techniques in an automated way to make to strive really for the big targets like energy efficiency. So that is our general approach. Let's go to one first quite simple application. It was already mentioned yesterday. I heard, I've heard it a lot of times. Um, if we want to support maintenance, then of course something like a fault tree analysis might be of interest. So that is not so new. But here we present the so-called SR Eagle, which is used in all the power plants in Germany uh, in, in, in real life. So that means you observe an undesired top event. You see, oh, my production is low. So the question is, what is the reason for a low production? The reason can be manifold. But if you have a fault tree analysis system, you can track it down to the root cause of it. Or you get probabilities what is the most probable root cause of it? This is also helpful because then you can plan your maintenance a little bit different and start with the most probable uh, 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 problem. So if you have a look at them in real life, uh, you see on top this number 0.733. So there, there might be a problem with a 73% uh, uh, probability. Uh, you see maybe on the, on the left side the 0.41. So 41% it is located somewhere on the left side. So if you go for maintenance work, you start with this point, and then later you go down uh, uh, the whole chain and uh, f try to find out what it is really is, and you can track it down to the, to the bottom. So that is not so new. Another one which is very important for maintenance uh, purposes is statistical process control, of course. Also, yesterday we had a few examples of it. Here we have a general tool which can be uh, uh, rolled out to any industry. Uh, what is the general idea of it? Um, you have, of course, an actual value on the upper left, the number one, for example, a differential pressure. So if you have a look at this system, in my, in my opinion, it is more or less a filling algorithm of a trend diagram. Yes, you see some, some big fluctuation, but you really don't know, is it good, is it bad, who knows. So what are we doing? We are comparing this actual value with a so-called reference model. This reference model can be anything. It can be a simple formula, it can be a neural model, it can be even more complex, it doesn't matter. It is very flexible. But it is a model of this delta pressure. Then, in the third step, you see you have an actual and a reference value coming from the model. 
The fourth step, which is very important, is building KPIs. That is basically dividing the actual value by the reference value. And then you get something like a signal which is a certain trend already. But still, that is not enough because the question is, is it now bad or is it good? What, at which point it is an alarm, let's say, and that can be done later by the SPC analysis here on the lower right uh, by using Schuhart diagrams or, and so on. And then you see very clearly here where the dots changing from the blue to the red color that now this delta pressure is a problem. And that might be much earlier than as a real problem comes to your, to your mind and when you really see, for example, loss of production or something like this. So it's a very important tool. But at the end of the day, of course, it is only monitoring. The maintenance group, for example, has to use it. It is in their hand. Another example, which I already mentioned very shortly, briefly, was uh, prediction is very important. Here, you see an example of the quality value of the clinker production in the cement plant. You see these green points, these green dots. So that are the measurements from the laboratory. Here, in this example, they are taking um, I think every two hours a sample. Two hours sampling, transport, analyzation. So after, let's say, three hours, the, the operator gets this information. But so, three hours have already gone. So if it was on bad quality, for example, three hours bad quality are in the silo. Hmm? So a continuous signal for the quality is a prediction, is a soft sensor. So, and that is what we provide with this peak predictor that is a red curve. This is available all the time on the operator screen, and you can use it. What is the technique behind the scenes? Of course, this is a model-based approach um, where process data and the lab results are correlated automatically in a model, and then it gives out a prediction of the free line. Very important, this thing must be adaptive. It must, it must be trained all the time during operation to keep its quality and this accuracy of the prediction. Again, it is a passive system. It is one signal more. So operators can use it or not. It depends. It depends on the organizational strengths of the company. Better, in my opinion, is to go for optimization. One word for the difference of what is optimization, what is automation, and so on. We come back to the car. The car itself is, in certain aspects, very good automated. So my distronic is keeping the distance to the front car. That is a benefit for me. Yeah? I can relax a little bit more. It will break automatically to the stop if necessary. Very good for me. For the society, it is maybe not bad, maybe this or that. Crash is, is, uh, 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 takes not place. OK, that's all. That is automation of a car. If we go for optimization, we can talk about how can we equalize, let's say, the load on our streets in a city. Then you have an optimization system on top steering all the cars in the city. That is an optimization, not just an automation. So in keeping this in mind, we go for the clinker production with a pit navigator. Navigation already says, okay, this thing is, is doing something in the right direction. So why is it so a big problem to make this operation in a cement plant automatically and optimized? Because, and that is the, 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 the biggest priority here, most processes in clinker production have a very long delay time. So that means you have time-delayed systems. You do increase your fuel on some burner now, and then you get a reaction of the complete process after, it depends, let's say 15 minutes to four hours. It depends a little bit what system we are talking about exactly, but there is a long delay time. It is not just one minute or two minutes. That would be easy and could be handled with classical control structures like a PID controller, which is built in everywhere. That is the most important point. And additionally, this discontinuous measurement of quality is also a problem for control. Then you have fluctuations in the process. Fuels and also the raw material are natural products. They are not the same all the time. They are fluctuating in their properties. So that must be handled somehow. It are disturbances to the system. And then another one is 
these black boxes. You have these big rotary kiln, you cannot look inside. You have coolers, which big housing, it's not so easy to look inside, and the same is true for this preheater tower I have shown. So it is more black boxes. So to have a little bit of sensoric, which gives better information, would be uh, a good idea. So the very demanding task for these operation people in the Siemens plant are they have to find stable working points for the whole system, that it works on a stable production level, energy intensity level, but at the same time keeping in mind what their technical and commercial requirements and site conditions are. And that makes it not so easy for an operator uh, to keep it on a very high efficient level. So what is our approach? First of all, the full automatic 24-7 control. That is just automation. That means really taking everything in the hands of the software and not just a few isolated control loops here and there. That is very important. Second, there must be a definition of something like a playground. So that means, and the engineering group comes and say, okay, this optimizer can work in this playground and play with the different process values to find the optimum solution at the moment. But not saying how to do it, just saying what to achieve and in which range. That is a big difference between automation and optimization. <clears throat> so the general structure of these kind of system is you have a plant management which gives objectives to the system, that is the optimization part. You have the operations which gives constraints to the systems, just saying do not go more than this and do not go more than this, find the best solution there. And then of course there is a control system core which directly interacts with the already existing plant DCS, giving set points for the fuels and for everything to this plant. And back come, of course, the measurements to the control system. And then you have a closed loop optimizing control. I don't want to go into detail what, what is happening inside too much, but a lot of control techniques are used, specifically tailor-made, let's say, for the certain problem domains. Here is an example from a Turkish customer uh, which def defines a playground. And you see, this playground is not defined by giving exact values for hundreds of parameters. No, it's just, what is it, uh, uh, five parameters which have to stay between an operational min and an operational max. And the target of the system is find the best setting to get best energy efficiency. That's all. The same type of system can be applied also to the mills, the grinding of these materials. We have seen in the overview there are a lot of mills involved, and mills are energy consuming. So optimizing them for an energy efficiency is also a good idea. Here the automation is typically a little bit better, so it is only more or less an optimization task. I just want to show you two diagrams, what can be expected from an advanced process control, really in terms of trends. If you look, have a look at this, you see on the lower side the green curve that is a so-called navigator on curve. So that means that is a switching point. Yeah? It was switched off and then it gets switched on. So and what you see directly is that the stability of the process improves a lot if you compare left to right side of the trends. That is a must-have for optimization. So it is a good optimization. But that's not enough. You have to make use of it. And that means Stabilize it not on any level, no, stabilize it on the right level. And that means if you have a look, for example, on this brown curve uh, uh, on, the, on the bottom, there you can see directly that the system was operated very stable in the beginning on some high level, as it was an easy level, but after switching on, the signal goes directly, significantly down, and is now operated on another level. That is an optimization step into the right direction. That means not just stabilizing somewhere, but stabilizing it there where it makes sense. So that is optimization. OK, that is just a few hours. So it doesn't mean too much. Now, who knows what is happening two hours later. Yeah? So I just want to give one last slide. And that is the question, how does it perform over, let's say, half a year? And here you see distribution diagrams. Blue is always a navigation mode, automatic optimization, 
and gray is, or gray and this red, is manual mode, operation like before. On the lower upper left, you see the production volume. You see there a significant production increase has taken place. Increase in production is at the same time reduction of specific energy in the grinding system. So that is a good result. Now let's have a look at stability issues. You see these three diagrams, the other three diagrams. The blue curve. So that means the process was always held very strictly on the point, on the desired point to achieve the result of the upper left diagram. So that is a very good control strength. And that is what you can expect and must expect of such a system. One aspect more is in the lower right picture. You see this big mountain and in blue, and then to the left, two smaller ones in blue, yeah, which just on the, on the lower left in, the, in, in this right diagram. So that means the process was not always controlled exactly on this big mountain. Sometimes it is controlled on other uh, points. And that is important because you have this natural material which means it must not always be operated on this one point. It must be operated on the point which is suitable for this material. So and that is what you also have to expect of such a system. So I hope you are still awake. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your audience. Please come to our booth here uh, at Steag uh, if you want to discuss this or that. Thank you. Thank you.